So welcome back to part two of fitness and sports in our human nutrition course. And we're going to start out talking about the metabolism of fat. And in particular, we call this aerobic metabolism because in order to break down fat, to use it as an energy source, oxygen must be present. Now, when we break down fat, fat is broken down into a chemical which is referred to as a fatty acid. Now, it's also stored uh, then in the body. The majority of energy is stored in the form of these fatty acids. And then those fatty acids can be used to produce ATP energy. And they're particularly converted into ATP by muscle cells. So it's really quite well known that if you want to lose any excess fat off of your body, you want to build muscle. The more muscle you build, the more fat the body consumes in order to produce energy for those muscle cells. So weightlifting is a really good sport in particular to build that muscle. And then with that extra muscle, you can do aerobic exercises to be able to get rid of the extra fat off of the body. So released from this adipose tissue where the fat is stored, we're going to release these um, fatty acids into the bloodstream that then travel to the muscle. And we use these as activity increases. And the more intense the activity, uh, up to a point, then the more fat we're able to use. So exercise, we said, can tone the muscles near adipose tissue, but just because, let's say, I'm doing sit-ups and I'm toning my abdominal muscles, it doesn't mean the abdominal muscles are just going to use the fat on my stomach. Unfortunately, uh, this kind of spot reduction doesn't actually get rid of the fat in that one particular area. The body kind of releases fat those fatty acids into the bloodstream from all over the body to be used by those abdominal muscles, which is just really too bad. So fat supplies more than two times the energy of carbohydrates. Really, it's about two and a half times the energy of carbohydrates. So we get a lot of energy from fat. And the ability of our muscles to use this fat for fuel is excellent and again it depends on the intensity of the exercise so if we're looking at this chart here we're looking at intensity of exercise towards the bottom and then we're also looking at protein versus carbohydrates versus fat and this is the percentage of total fuel that's used so one of the things we know is at rest or during very light activity we use about a 50-50 ratio of carbohydrates and fat to generate ATP. Now, I just want to take a little side note here and talk about this new, uh, I don't know what you call it, diet. I'm not really sure that's out there. They're calling it the Sleeping Beauty Diet. Um, and actually, I guess I shouldn't say that this is new. It's not new. It's just something that has kind of resurged. And this is the diet where people are literally taking sleeping pills to put themselves to sleep so that they lose weight. Now, uh, this is extremely unhealthy and people can die from this. And so I highly recommend that you stay as far away from this type of diet as possible. And like I said, there have already been people who have died from this type of dieting. So. If you hear of anybody saying this is a great idea, it really, really is not a good idea because one of the other things you have to think about is if you're sleeping all the time, then um, the muscles can't perform work. And if they can't perform work, then they atrophy, they fall apart, muscle cells die. And when something like that happens, okay, remember if muscle is consuming fat, and I would assume that the whole idea of this Sleeping Beauty diet is so that the amount of fat on the body decreases. 
Uh, and if our muscles are atrophying because we're sleeping too much and the muscles are what eats away the fat, then we're not really going to be losing that much fat off of the body. You have to do some intense sleeping to lose any type of fat. And unfortunately, when you start to lose weight, what you're really doing is you're losing proteins instead of fat. And by the way, this is the same identical thing that happens if you go on a starvation diet where you're consistently day after day eating a thousand calories or less you're really utilizing protein and our body can't handle us breaking protein down as an energy source so you start losing your hair you lose your muscle and keep in mind that also means the cardiac muscle the heart starts to deteriorate it's a very very bad type of diet so as activity intensifies, okay, so like if I'm sprinting, so I'm moving very quickly, very fast, uh, and it becomes anaerobic. So the more intense the exercise, and we talked about this in the last video, the less I can get blood to circulate around, the less oxygen I can get to my muscles and the rest of the body. And what happens is I um, the process supplies needs to supply quick fuel. So the reason I have an anaerobic versus an aerobic process is the anaerobic process can supply ATP quickly, although it doesn't last really super well. The aerobic process uh, supplies ATP. It's a little bit slower, but it also can last longer. So what will happen is I have to, if I'm exercising more vigorously, I have to start using more carbohydrates if I'm super duper vigorously exercising and I become very, very anaerobic because I can't burn, burn fat very well. So if you look at this chart here, you can see, okay, carbohydrates are down here, protein is here. And by the way, let's look at protein, or excuse me, carbohydrates are here, fat is here. Let's look at protein down here. I'm really not changing the consumption of protein during exercise, okay, which means I want to be using carbohydrates, I want to be using fat. And so the more intense I exercise, the less fat I'm able to use if I become more and more anaerobic, okay. So you want to keep it below that 80% level because in doing so, I can usually split the amount of fuel source between my carbs and my fats about 50-50. Now, we will talk about this in a little bit, uh, but you know that the keto diet has become very, very popular, and uh, we'll talk about how the keto diet can actually change uh, the requirements, you might say, for fuel sources in the body. So except during endurance exercise, very little protein is used for fuel. And what I mean there by endurance exercise is I mean you're doing a lot of long distance exercising day after day after day. So for instance, you're running 10, 15 miles a day. When that happens, your body doesn't have the ability to uh, consume and utilize carbohydrates and fats appropriately. So it does actually turn to some protein to um, use as a fat, or excuse me, as a, an, an energy source. And you've probably seen this, I mean, especially if you watch like marathons, you can see a lot of these people who run these marathons, it, it looks like it's impossible for them to run them because they're so skinny. I mean, some of them, at least to me, almost look like they're skeletons with a little bit of skin on top of them. But that's because they're running so much and they're doing these endurance exercises so much they actually can't consume enough calories for the body and so what the body has to do to stay alive is it's kind of like they're feeding a concentration camp victim and they have to feed the individual their own proteins just to sustain life so some research on that fat adaptation, and this is where that keto diet comes in, uh, it's becoming more popular, especially for endurance athletes. And what happens is 
if I'm eating more fat in my diet and I'm eating less carbs, I'm restricting the amount of carbohydrates in my diet, what we are seeing, at least for some people, is that they have the ability to convert in their cells how they utilize energy. And for some individuals, their cells are excellent at consuming fat as an energy source. And the more they stay on this keto diet, the more um, they become good, better at consuming and utilizing fat as an energy source. So they have this limitless supply of fat that they can store for their muscles. And so that is an excellent source of energy for them. And instead of uh, having more carbohydrates, like prior to an event, so they do that carb loading, instead they actually eat even more fat. And another thing they say is good about this is that the fat doesn't allow them to retain water. Uh, and so one of the things that's very interesting in this research also, and I think we've talked about this before, is that some people, their body is very, very good at learning how or adapting to this fat conversion. Other people don't seem to be quite as good. And now there's a lot of research that's out there that's showing that there is probably two different, and I don't know, maybe there's more, but at this point, two different body types. And one of those body types genetically can do this fat conversion, this fat adaptation, using fat as an excellent source of energy, whereas other people do need uh, a higher carbohydrate, complex carbohydrate, let's just put that in quotations there, complex carbohydrate, lower fat diet. Now, I'm not talking about a super restricted low fat diet here. You cannot be an athlete and have a restricted super low fat diet. The body, the muscles need this fat source. When we look at proteins, our body obviously can utilize protein as an energy source. And we do use some protein during low to moderate intensity, but not a lot, okay? It only provides about 5% of our energy needs. Now, when we start to do that more endurance exercise, we do start to break down more protein, and it provides about 10 to 15% of our energy needs. So when we utilize proteins, what's happening is we're breaking those proteins down into amino acids, in particular what we call these branch chains amino acids, and they're the ones that provide most of this energy. Now, when we're doing any kind of resistance exercises, we don't utilize as much protein as we would like running a marathon, okay? So if I'm riding a bicycle, for instance, I wouldn't use as much protein for an energy source as if I am um, uh, running this long marathon. So in the average American diet, the amount of protein that someone would eat in a day, just a regular good amount of protein, is adequate for their energy needs. Uh, supplements are not needed. And, you know, supplements in the uh, American culture uh, pr these protein powders and all are over abused and you have to be very careful of adding these because things like protein powders uh, now they all break down to amino acids in the body and those amino acids get into your bloodstream and those amino acids don't necessarily go to your muscle and build muscle several things can happen to those amino acids one yes it can build muscle but two, those amino acids can also be converted to fat. So that's just something to think about. But even more than that, those amino acids, when they're in your bloodstream in higher than normal concentrations, they attract water into your blood. The more water in your blood, the higher your blood pressure. That becomes dangerous. That high blood pressure can cause problems with your kidneys as well. And your kidneys have to clear all those extra amino acids out of the bloodstream and that becomes very harsh on the kidneys and what we see is people who abuse these protein powders uh, a lot of times 
not only do they have high blood pressure, but then they go on to have renal failure. So you want to be careful using the excess protein powders and just use the calories in a good healthy diet to be able to do the types of exercise you want to do. So reasons why athletes require more protein than sedentary adults, and then we're not talking a whole bunch more, okay? But overall calorie needs are increased to meet the demands of the physical activity. So, of course, you know, if you think about this, it kind of makes sense. I'm using my muscles more, and as I use my muscles, some of the protein in my muscles do break down. And some of those amino acids are metabolized into fuel, and I do need to increase the protein in my diet. And, you know, especially if we're talking about women, women have a tendency not to consume a lot of protein in their diet. Uh, even if they're just sedentary women, they don't eat as much meat. And so becoming an athlete, you really do have to increase the consumption of protein. Uh, and sometimes you'll know right away that you eat, need to eat more because you have a craving for protein. You have a craving for chicken or you have a craving for beef or fish. And you know, oh boy, I need more protein in my diet. And it's really very difficult to overconsume uh, meat in comparison to overconsuming protein supplements. So athletes, especially those involved in strength training, need additional amino acids to help to repair those damaged muscles and also to be able to produce more muscle. And certain amino acids also act as chemical signals in the body that can regulate what we call protein synthesis as well as other metabolic processes. And protein synthesis would be uh, building proteins up. So you need those amino acids in order to keep those chemical processes going. So can physical training affect fuel use? Now this is kind of interesting. So the training effect. Initially a person is going to get really tired uh, probably in about 15 or 20 minutes, maybe even less depending on how out of shape they are after they start to exercise. But typically about six months if they keep the exercise up and let's just say they're exercising every other day, okay? they keep the exercise up for about six months, they're going to see a vast improvement in how long before they fatigue. And usually they can go within six months about an hour or more. So the results from these changes in exercise, okay, uh, is our ability to generate more ATP. And there's several things that's going on. Our bodies are becoming healthier. They're able to do these metabolic processes better. So for instance, the more I exercise, the more my cells become sensitive to insulin. That means that insulin can bind to my cells and open gates on the outside of my cells and then insulin is transported from the bloodstream into my cell and you know, or excuse me, I keep saying insulin, didn't I? So let me say that again. So insulin binds to the gates on my cell and those gates open to allow glucose to be transported from the bloodstream into the cells to make ATP. Also, if I have extra glucose floating around, now I have an increased ability to store this glucose in the form of glycogen in my muscles. And that will allow my muscles to produce ATP quickly if I need it. Also, I have an increased storage and use of triglycerides. Now, that doesn't mean I'm going to store more fat per se, but what it really means is that the fat I store, I can break down more efficiently into ATP. And that's the same thing with proteins. My proteins being broken down into amino acids and then converted to ATP also becomes more efficient. So whether it's carbohydrates, proteins, or fats, I have a greater efficiency in the production of ATP for energy, especially whether really I'm exercising or I'm not. That's something else we didn't really talk about because 
What we also see is when a person exercises more, their metabolism revs up even when they're not exercising. So they have a greater ability to utilize fats, especially as an energy source to produce more ATP. So the more you exercise, the more energy you will have in your daily life. So where do all these energy sources come from that the muscle cells use? And of course, we know ATP is a big one, and the muscles are using this all the time, and we're getting this from uh, our carbs, our fats, our proteins. And it doesn't matter what kind of activity we're doing, the muscles are going to use ATP. Now, we also talked about the phosphocreatine, and phosphocreatine is used for those short bursts of exercise. So that might be like uh, bench pressing or shot put or high jump or uh, off the block sprint type of thing. Now, carbohydrates can be broken down anaerobically and aerobically. So when we use it for anaerobic metabolism, it's gonna be during those high intensity exercises, especially lasting uh, 30 seconds to two minutes. So that is like the sprint that someone might be doing where they're running really super fast for a short period of time. Aerobic exercise is lasting two minutes to several hours. The higher the intensity, the greater the use. Now, that could be basketball, swimming, jogging, soccer. Okay, so fat metabolism aerobically, okay, is going to occur in exercise lasting from two minutes to several hours, and this is a high intensity exercise. So like, for instance, running a six minute mile for several miles. And this is um, long distance running, cycling, any type of high brisk walking type of thing, or even uh, fast swimming laps. Proteins are going to be aerobically metabolized, but we use low amounts during any type of exercise. If we increase the endurance exercise, then we're going to use more proteins, okay? That would be especially as our carbohydrates are used up. And again, this would be long distance running like marathon running. Strength and power athletes. So how do they enhance muscle? So that obviously is something that's very important. And due to needing more lean muscle mass, they have to consume more calories. And so those have to be healthy calories balanced between proteins, carbohydrates, and fats. Phosphocreatine as well as carbohydrates are needed for that brief burst of activity. So you have to make sure that you are increasing your carbohydrate intake. Now, again, this depends on the individual and for some individuals, just increasing the amount of fat, like that keto diet, is going to be much better for them than other individuals. So Now, these power athletes, they tend to emphasize protein. And if you read all the magazines about bodybuilding and all, they talk all about these protein powders and supplements. And um, really, they're not needed as much as they are emphasized. Most is needed early on in that initial building of the muscle, uh, but once you have large amounts of muscle, you don't usually lose that muscle. You don't need as much protein. Now, some protein is obviously needed in their diet, and they have a huge craving for protein depending on how hard they're working out. Uh, and so they may need to consume more protein. Uh, but again, the protein powder, that's going to be typically far too much protein than what they actually need. So before and during strength and power training, what does an athlete need? And one of the big deals is hydration. Lots and lots and lots of water. Make sure that you're nicely hydrated. 
And the best way to look at that is to figure out what color your urine is. And the urine really should not be anything darker than like a, a lemonade type of color. So the darker the urine, the more concentrated it is, which means you're not consuming enough fluid. Okay, And we'll talk about the sports drinks just a little bit. Also, making sure you have that adequate ingestion of carbohydrates and the adequate ingestion of fat before and after exercise. And some people think that creatine supplements are helpful. Um, not really sure that there's been any proof to that, that that really is true. Fat intake should be, uh, for a person, at least 25 to 35% of their total calories. Now that's more than what you're told by that eating chart, that pyramid, okay? So just keep that in mind. So as far as fluids are concerned, the average adult not exercising for a woman needs about 9 cups a day, for a man about 13 cups a day. Now also keep in mind, okay, that in the water that you drink, now we're just talking water here, we're not talking Gatorade or anything like that. In the water that you drink, this is where we get a tremendous amount of our minerals, okay, in our daily diet, is in the water we drink. So if you're a person who's drinking mainly bottled water, or you're a person who's drinking mainly filtered water, you may find that you are mineral deficient. Uh, and it can get to the case where a person is extremely, not just slightly, but extremely mineral deficient. So you have to be careful to drink enough fluid, but you also have to be careful to drink enough fluid that has the appropriate minerals in it to keep the body healthy as well. Of course, if you're an athlete, you're going to need more than that because you're going to be sweating fluid out. And you want to make sure that you are keeping the body cool. So as muscles are working, and what I mean by that is as they're uh, breaking down fats and as they're moving, they're going to produce heat. And our body cannot handle getting too hot. If it gets too hot, it starts to break down. So we don't want dehydration to occur because we can become ill. We can even die from severe dehydration. And then if we are dehydrated, it decreases our endurance. It decreases our strength and performance. And you want to be careful, especially if you live in the high desert in California, not to exercise during a super hot day. And if you live in other places, you don't want to exercise, especially when it's hot and humid, because then it's extremely hard to sweat and to cool off the body. So fluid replacement, a lot of people go, well, I'm not thirsty, so I don't drink. Well, that's not a reliable indicator. Like I said, take a look at the color of your urine. That can be helpful. Is your urine darker than lemonade? And if it is, well, then you probably need to drink more. Uh, really, really, really healthy urine is even lighter than lemonade, okay? Really super healthy urine is typically almost clear. So general guidelines for how much fluid to drink. When you're exercising before an event, you should be drinking plenty of fluid. And then you drink 5 to 7 milliliters per kilogram of body weight at least four hours before the exercise. During the event, you're consuming one and a half to two, two, excuse me, one and a half to three and a half cups per hour for the event lasting longer than 30 minutes. And then after exercise, you wanna replenish everything you've lost again. So within four to six hours, you're gonna be consuming two to three cups of fluid for every pound that you've lost. Now, some people will be exercising hard enough that they can lose several pounds during that exercise routine. So you want to make sure that you're replacing that because the poundage that you're losing is all fluid. All right, so let's go through different problems that happen if you're not keeping yourself cool enough, drinking enough, and one of those is heat exhaustion. 
So this is a heat-related illness, and the symptoms would include profuse sweating, headaches, dizziness, nausea, muscle weakness, visual disturbances, flushed skin, hyperthermia, and then heat cramps. So heat stress will cause a depletion of blood volume, okay? So if I'm losing all this fluid and I'm sweating all this off, then my blood actually releases some fluid so that it can move onto the surface of my skin to help cool the body down because if I don't get the body cool enough, I potentially could die from this. But if I'm losing blood volume, my blood pressure is going to drop too and that can become dangerous. Of course, the recommended treatment move to someplace cool, get inside, under a tree, whatever it may be, take off any excess clothes, and then add ice packs and cold water, whatever you've got to cool the person down quickly. And then if you can get them revived enough to get them to drink or if you have to take them to the hospital, an IV of lost fluids and electrolytes. Now, one of the things that can happen is a person can get what are called heat cramps, and this is a complication usually of heat exhaustion. So I've been exercising for several hours in a hot climate. I'm uh, sweating a whole bunch. I've lost a lot of fluid. Um, and then I consume large volumes of water without replacing any electrolytes. When that happens, that can cause my muscles to start to cramp. And so what's very important is I need to replace those electrolytes in what I'm also drinking to prevent those muscle cramps. Because when I drink all that fluid, that lowers the concentration of the electrolytes that are still in my body. And I've sweated a lot of those electrolytes out as well and so it's a double whammy on my body to have sweated them out and then to have uh, increased the amount of fluid in the body but not the amount of electrolytes. All right, so now there's also something called heat stroke. And what happens here is I'm continuing to work out. I'm really, really hot. And um, I have a lot of blood flow that's going to my muscles. And so what happens is um, I am not able to cool the body off enough. So in order to cool my body off when I'm not exercising, okay, or when I'm just exercising in the beginning, even if I'm in a hot environment, my body is going to move my blood up towards the surface of my skin. Now what's happened is my blood is flowing through the body and as the blood flows through the body it's picking up heat from the various organs including my muscles. The blood then transfers that heat to the surface of my skin and then the blood comes out of my body through my skin and helps to cool me off. But if I'm really working hard and it is super hot, a lot of my blood is going to my working muscles instead of going to the surface of my skin and radiating that heat out of the body. So my body temperature begins to increase. And if my body temperature hits 104 degrees Fahrenheit, which is about 40 degrees Celsius, then what happens is the body starts to do something we call denature. It starts to break down. And in about 10% of cases of heat stroke, the person dies. So the symptoms of heat stroke are hyperthermia, hot, dry skin, because I'm not sweating anymore, nausea, confusion, irritability, um, also I, uh, fainting, I have poor coordination, seizure, and then even coma. Recommended treatment again, get this person cooled down as quickly as you can. Ice packs, number one, and then cold water over the body, and immediately seek professional medical attention. All right, so let's talk about different things that I can drink. Uh, before, during, and after exercise. And of course, one of the things that people just love to drink are sports drinks. 
Now, before we get into this, let me just tell you that originally the very first sports drink, which was Gatorade, came into being because these two physiology professors from the University of Florida wanted their football team to do better. And so they came up with this electrolyte drink. And now Gatorade, um, it doesn't taste quite the same anymore. Uh, it used to taste just like a whole bunch of electrolytes, this salty mixture that if you drank too much of it too fast, you kind of got a little sick in your stomach. And uh, Gatorade has been dramatically changed since the beginning. But sports drinks, depending on the type of sports drink, it is recommended to help to keep the blood glucose levels and the blood volume levels up during uh, the sports activity. However, you have to remember you don't want to be drinking too much of just a sugary substance. That's not the whole idea. This sports drink needs to be a drink that is an electrolyte sports drink. So if you're doing less than 60 minutes, really you don't need any type of sports drink. The water loss through sweat is the main thing. You're not really going to lose a whole bunch of electrolytes. All you have to do is drink some water and then eat your regular dinner or lunch or whatever and you should be replacing those electrolytes pretty well. So only when the exercise becomes really, really intense are sports drinks even recommended. Now one of the other problems is water intoxication. You don't want to drink too much water. Now for most people that's not going to be an issue because most people don't drink too much water in their everyday diet. Drinking too much water is going to cause a decrease in the concentration of sodium and potassium and chloride ions which are extremely important and we've talked about what these ions do in the body in previous videos and one of the things we know is that these ions are there helping to regulate the cardiovascular system they're regulating the central nervous system and so obviously if those ions aren't present then there can be all kinds of issues so possibly this can happen during activities where I am drinking lots and lots of water, but I'm not really exercising that hard. I don't have very little, or I do have very little water loss. And so the recommendations are we do need to drink, but we need to not drink quite as much as somebody who might create water intoxication in their body. Uh, and if you're going to exercise hard, you want to make sure that you are drinking some type of drink that has some sodium, probably some potassium and chloride in there, magnesium, okay? Uh, and what you don't want to see is you don't want to see yourself gaining weight during exercise. That's telling you that you're retaining too much water. Now, another thing that athletes obviously need are they're going to need all those vitamins and then those minerals as well to be able to keep the body healthy and allowing the body to go for longer periods of time and have plenty of energy. But the needs for micronutrients are pretty much the same for people who are exercising as for people who are sedentary, okay? Uh, they might have higher caloric need and higher caloric intake um, and what we'll see with athletes is that that also increases the amount of vitamins and minerals that they take in. So All right, let's try this one more time. Here we go. So, of course, something else that's very important for athletes is to have the right intake of both vitamins and minerals. Now, their need, if you're an athlete, the need is going to be uh, slightly higher than for somebody who's sedentary. 
Now, of course, an athlete is going to have a higher caloric intake, which hopefully that will also increase the amount of vitamins and minerals that they're eating on a daily basis. And then the question is, do they need to take any type of multivitamins? Well, that might be the case where you're talking about an athlete who's a vegetarian. That vegetarian may not be getting uh, as balanced a diet uh, unless they're really good at how they eat. So it might be beneficial to a vegetarian athlete to have supplements of multivitamins and minerals. Iron is very important as far as an athlete is concerned, especially female athletes. So if you're really talking an athlete who is working out and uh, doing this competitively, their iron needs to be checked fairly regularly because the iron in the blood is what's carrying oxygen. And if that iron level goes too low, they're going to start to feel tremendous fatigue. And this can happen with female athletes, especially because you have a female who's menstruating and losing iron that way and could be losing iron because uh, she may have an increase in the amount of plasma volume, okay, and not as many red blood cells. And this is what we call sports anemia. So you have to be really uh, cognizant of that potentially happening in female athletes. So you want to focus on making sure they're eating those iron-rich foods and also taking, uh, if they need it, an iron supplement. Now, you don't want to take too much iron because too much iron can become toxic for the individual, and this is why you're also checking the iron levels regularly. Calcium, of course, is very important in an athlete because you don't want to be deficient in calcium. You don't want to see, uh, for instance, stress fractures occurring. This can especially occur in women and especially in women who are menstruating. And these are typically athletes who are endurance athletes where we see these types of stress fractures, like for instance, gymnasts and ballerinas. And yes, a ballerina is definitely an athlete and they experience these types of fractures if they don't have the appropriate diet. And a lot of times, because they're trying to keep their weight low, uh, they have restrictions of dairy products from their diet. And like I said, this can compromise bone health. We can also have severe bone loss, osteoporosis in the athlete as well. B vitamins, super important because B vitamins are going to help with energy metabolism. They're going to help with red blood cell production. And a lot of your B vitamins, and we're just going to go over this real quick, they function as what we would call coenzymes. These are going to be chemicals that help to maintain ATP production from carbohydrates, fats, and proteins, also giving that athlete more energy. We have vitamin B9, which is folate, B6, B12. Those are helping to form red blood cells that transport that oxygen. Another important micronutrient are the antioxidants. They're going to prevent oxidative damage in our athlete. Vitamin E and vitamin C are needed in a slightly higher level in an athlete. And so we want to make sure they're eating foods rich in these antioxidants, our fruits and vegetables, whole grains and cereals, uh, appropriate vegetable oils such as olive oil, and then large doses of vitamin E and C may also be required, okay? Um, we don't know if the larger the dose, the healthier the person. Really, a lot of the... Um, peer-reviewed articles are kind of inconsistent on this, but some people swear by it. Now something else I want you to know about is called ergogenic aids that help with athletic performance. So an ergogenic aid is a mechanical, nutritional, psychological, pharmacological, or physiological substance or treatment intended to improve exercise performance, okay? So these could include good water intake, electrolytes, adequate carbohydrates, balanced meals, 
uh, a good diet. Uh, it could also include things like counseling, okay? That could also aid people in their performance. Uh, protein, amino acid supplements are not really considered necessary, so these are not really something an athlete needs. Uh, dietary supplements shouldn't really be used for dietary shortcomings, so you really need to be eating uh, appropriately. Even though the U.S. sports nutrition supplement market in 2014 reached $5.9 billion. So a lot of people think these supplements are needed. But they haven't been scientifically validated as helpful. As a matter of fact, the opposite is true. And along the way, some substances that were thought to be really good for you have been banned. So probably, like it says here, there's no magic bullet to improve your training routine. And of course, uh, illegal substances are definitely not something that should be used as an ergogenic aid for athletic performance, such as steroids. So something that could be used uh, to provide additional fuel would be like the gels, the bars, the chews, and uh, they're kind of expensive depending on what kind you get. Uh, they can be pretty expensive, and of course, you should always take these with fluid. The ideal bars for endurance athletes would contain 40 grams of carbs, 10 grams of protein, 4 grams of fat, 5 grams of fiber. Now, again, this is for someone who is depending mainly on carbohydrates in their diet. But if you are a person that is depending mainly on fat in your diet, these uh, bars and gels would not be something that would be recommended. So some other useful ergogenic aids, people have said like beetroot juice to enhance endurance by improving oxygen consumption. Uh, beta alanine, it increases muscle carnosine. It, that's a protein that neutralizes the acids like lactic acids in the muscle. Uh, caffeine, okay, they say that increases mental alertness, it increases endurance performance. Creatine, they say increases lean muscle mass and improves exercise performance on the short term, also muscle recovery. Baking soda or sodium bicarbonate neutralizes acid that contributes to muscle fatigue. Now, none of these have been scientifically proven to assist in, ac in athletic performance, okay? None of them. And I really want to stress to be really super careful of using caffeine during or right before exercise because what it also does is it increases blood pressure and it increases heart rate, which can lead to other issues during performance and especially if you have somebody who is super out of shape you may uh, increase the risk of heart attack. So some dangerous or illegal substances or practices anabolic steroids and this would be like testosterone and androstenedione, tetrahydrogesterone uh, these are super no-nos but what they do is they increase muscle mass and they increase strength. But look at all the risks. Liver cysts, cardiovascular disease, hypertension, reproductive dysfunction, depression, sleep disturbances, that roid rage, getting angry, uh, and, you know, it's just banned in the United States. Blood doping. Okay, so blood doping. This was like one of the first practices to increase endurance. So what I would do, or what a person would do, is... Uh, a few weeks before they were supposed to compete. Somebody would take a few vials of that individual's blood, store that blood away later, and a couple of hours before the competition, that blood would then be injected back into the person. What that would do is it would increase the number of red blood cells the person had, thereby increasing their ability to carry oxygen, make more ATP, they could go harder, they could go faster. The only problem is that thickens your blood 
that increases blood pressure. It puts a strain on the heart. It can kill you. Uh, ephedrine, this is another stimulant, way more powerful than uh, caffeine. It's kind of like speed. It increases muscle strength and power, promotes mental alertness, even can help with weight loss. Ephedrine you used to be able to buy over the counter as a weight loss pill. Uh, but it causes anxiety and it increases heart rate, causes heart palpitations and can kill somebody. And then there's GHB, gamma hydroxybutyric acid. This is an alternative type of uh, chemical to steroids used for bodybuilding to increase muscle mass. And, but the side effects, not pretty. Vomiting, dizziness, tremors, seizures, and death. So it's illegal to make it, to sell it, to have it in the United States. Growth hormone. It's thought to increase muscle mass and to increase fat metabolism so that you also lose that fat weight. And the only problem is, is that growth hormone doesn't just increase muscles. If you are taking true growth hormone, it can increase every organ system in the body. The heart, the bones, uh, everything. And one of the problems is that it can also cause death. And before it even causes death, it causes a lot of very negative, bad, even painful side effects. So what would you choose? Both Powerade and Cliff Shot Turbo would replenish carbohydrates and electrolytes. Powerade would also fulfill your fluid needs. Now that Cliff Shot Turbo is a gel, by the way. Uh, need to grab water along the course if you use that energy gel. You've got to drink water with that thing. The energy gel has the advantage of being light and portable, plus there's caffeine in that. And so you'll see some athletes, as long as it's not banned in their competition, uh, sucking on that gel and drinking fluids. And what they're doing is they're increasing their caffeine, so they're increasing heart rate, hoping that that gives them the energy they need to keep going. All right, and that is the end of Fitness and Sports Part 2. Thank you for listening.